Good evening, this is Pamela, and you're listening to Watchmen on the Pod. We're going to continue in our book reading today of The Unbreakable Covenant of Marriage by Raymond McMahon. Unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Plea fornication. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 This is fantastic advice for today's morally loose so-called free culture. It has often been said that men respond to what they see and that women respond to touch. If Paul was concerned for the sanctity of the Christian men and women in their congregation, then how much more should we be concerned about how the young adults and teenagers of today are interacting with one each other. Moral decay begins in the hearts of individuals, but can quickly spread to families and the culture at large. In order to combat this decay, we must shore up the foundations of society, the family unit. As Christians are, I'm sorry, as Christians too are the salt of the earth, it is our job to preserve marriage as an institution that God has ordained, to keep societal decay at bay. We are not only failing to teach our children family values, but also basic human kindness. What are the schools teaching American children to do today? Are they taught the parable of the Good Samaritan? Or are they taught without balance the fear of all strangers? so much so that there is a death of charity. In Connecticut recently, an elderly man was struck by a car on a street of Hartford. This was captured on video, and it was both shown and commented on nationwide, especially when it appeared that no one would do anything about the tragic situation. Now think. Now, thank God a few folks called 911 about a minute later but no one went to stop or redirect traffic or to see if the man's clear needs, see to the man's clear needs. Are the children taught purity and integrity in the schools? We tell them to just say no to the use of drugs and alcohol, but will any speak up against the behavior such as fornication, promiscuity, unclean behaviors, etc.? Knowing full well that harmful and even Deadly health risks are associated with such behaviors. My children, having attended both Christian and secular colleges, have reported back to me their strong concern at how commonly fornication is practiced, as some say, hooking up among the young people claiming Christ or not. At the various meet to encourage each other in Christ and to grow in their faith, my children have met quite a number of young Christians who did not seem to know that fornication was a sin. Many of these Christian friends, when presented with this truth, repented and made things right, even if their partner got mad and broke up with them. Are their parents and pastors back home afraid to share these clear truths with the youth, perhaps out of fear that they will lose them? Fornication is deadly in so many ways. It breeds both selfishness and future distrust, baggage. When those who have not repented of it enter into their marriage covenants later. The medical and educational professionals also know full well the risks to the physical, social, and psychological well-being of the children who are experimenting with these behaviors. By refusing to encourage sexual abstinence among young people, they are at times, wittingly or not, actually encouraging our youth to engage in these behaviors. The widespread fornication in our country today is a precursor to the divorces and remarriages that occur later. Statistics reveal that those who live together before marriage have a much higher rate of divorce. The consequences have been devastating in the catching and spreading of diseases, in unwanted pregnancies, in the subsequent abortions, and in the wounding of body and spirit. All this also produced educational and financial derailment. Have we lost our collective minds? 
<clears throat> and although some schools are warning the children of the physical dangers of unsafe sex, they are not even close to sharing the truth of God's word on the subject. By failing to model and to insist on godly behavior, including the way we treat our covenant spouses, we have allowed our precious children to leave the protection that the Lord provides to the obedient. Have we forgotten that Jesus said that the tree will be known by its fruit? These divorce remarriage situations represent a tree whose fruit is corrupt and devastating. Go seek out the many studies and surveys that are available from the Barna Group, the Rutgers Study, etc. Even major news magazines have presented facts and statistics decrying the effects of divorce, remarriage, on children, on health, on finances, and the list goes on. I do not have the time or space to share the statistics in this book, but you can search out several books from the suggested reading list at the end of this book that do present clear statistical evidence regarding the disastrous effects marriage, divorce, and remarriage have had on the family structure and on society as a whole. <clears throat> Are you afraid to be old-fashioned in your values today? Too many people have accepted the lie that God's ways are restrictive and moralistic when, in fact, he establishes guidelines that brings blessings upon all human relationships developed under the aegis of his wise and loving protection. We all need to teach our children at home the facts of life cheerfully with biblical wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We need to be modeling those same virtues before them through the power of Christ and of the Holy Ghost. It is a wonderful thing to observe groups of young people who really get this. They can be friends and show self-control a sense of humor, while at the same time liking someone without being either awkward or inappropriate. Many may read that last paragraph and think that to expect this from teenagers is naive and unrealistic. So let me ask you this. Where is your faith? Is it bound by cultural norms and expectations or encouraged by the promises found in the Word of God? Of course, we are always to remain watchful unto prayer like Job, expecting and teaching the best, but watching out for the worst. How about some positive peer pressure for a change? I know from personal experience that my children appreciate it when I am upfront, honest, and even joyful as we talk about what is going on around us today. They are both affirmed and equipped in their rights and responsibilities to say no and or yes with understanding about the situations they face and the relationships they have. They know that they are not saved by me but by Jesus and that they will answer to him for the choices they make. They are learning to seek Christ's guidance in their decisions shouldn't we all? I tell my children that when you marry, you are not to be unequally yoked to an unbeliever, and that marriage is indeed till death do us part. I think that some of them are concluding, like Christ's disciples, that if that be the case, then it is good for them not to marry at all. Joke. But I also tell them that when they marry, they are in one sense marrying into another family joining the hopes of both sides of the families for beautiful grandchildren and fellowship. Hopefully, the engaged couple would seek and receive the blessing of all the parents and in-laws. It is a beautiful but serious covenant to enter. Paul prophesied that the perils of the last days included the following. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, unthankful, without natural affection, truce breakers, fears, traitors, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Second Timothy chapter 3, 1-5 through five. That people are being and acting like this is exactly why many marriages are failing today. First of all, many do not want, do not marry anyone with the understanding that the marriage covenant is to last till death of one of the spouses. This failure, however, does not change God's viewpoint. 
Secondly, we are living in the last days, the selfish times of which Paul prophesied. Husbands and wife both have coveted uh, other men or women. People have been fierce and angry with each other instead of meek and lowly. We and our children are discouraged from showing natural, appropriate affection. Spouses stop communicating love and so-called drift apart over time. Some seek their own happiness without considering their spouse's feelings. We say that we are going to get what we deserve in this life. Appreciation is not demonstrated. Everyone goes to their corner and will not forgive. Many have become covenant breakers, truce breakers, and traitors, etc. In contrast to this, Apostle Paul told Timothy that he was to treat the younger women as sisters with all purity. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 2. He told Titus that both the young men and the women are to be discreet and sober, that they be in a behavior as becometh holiness. Titus chapter 2 verse 3. Paul gave Titus the following instruction. In all things, shewing thyself a pattern of good works into doctrine, shewing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Titus chapter 2, 7 through 8 and 11 through 15. The permission to be remarried to another if one's covenant spouse is still living represents doctrinal corruptness. We are supposed to deny ungodly and worldly lusts and contrary rise demonstrate fidelity to our marriage vows even if it is to our own hurt, for a for worse part of our marriage vows. We are called to be a, a peculiar people, as Paul said above, zealous of good works. Peter, writing in his epistle, also said that we are to be a peculiar people, that we should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. We are to live a purified life. We are to show forth our love for Jesus and his fidelity to us with praise and worship. Peter said that we are to be a holy nation, but instead we have been profaning the holiness of the Lord. Jesus came to redeem us from all iniquity. Do you believe that Jesus can help you straighten things out? To avoid fornication Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. This verse flows from verse 1 that was discussed a few pages ago. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Then Paul teaches that to avoid fornication, which is pornea, the same Greek word used in Matthew 5, where Jesus says, saving for the cause of fornication. Every man was to have his own wife, and every woman was to have her own husband. The word own is very specific here. Neither was to have anybody else's spouse, but only their own. Fornication is clearly intended here to mean premarital relations before entering into one's covenant marriage. Fornication is also contrasted with adultery in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, and Matthew 19, verse 9, Mark chapter 7, verse 21, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, and Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. In each of these cases, fornication, pornea, is used in a narrow sense 
referring to a sexual relations before marriage, whether engaged, a spouse, betrothed or not, and each time it is used in clear contrast to adultery, which is mokia in Greek, referring to sexual relation with others besides one spouse that violate the married covenant. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, fornication is used in a broader sense. Someone in the midst was reported to have had intimate relation with his father's wife. Paul told the Corinthians that they should be mourning about this and praying that the man who had done this should be removed from their midst. In 2 Corinthians 7, you can read how the Christians responded to Paul's admonition. And you can learn of the heart of Christ in Paul's verse 12. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Many of you reading this book are in the state of adultery of which Jesus spoke. Many of you know others, even in the church, that are in these state-sanctioned, legalized adulteries. Those of you who minister the Word of God must, before God Almighty, come to grips with Jesus' teaching about this. Do not err before the Holy God of creation, my beloved brethren, and seek to justify that which God hates and opposes. Speak the truth in love with clarity, patience, and long-suffering, but no longer compromise with God's holiness. Do not be like the Pharisees that Jesus exposed in Luke 16. Should we not rather, as the body of Christ, with such amazing and precious promises given to us from Jesus, seek to obey Paul's instruction to us in 2 Corinthians 7, 1? Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This is what we need to be doing in the churches worldwide today. We need to legally break off all these adulteries as Jesus defined them, and we need to seek forgiveness and reconciliation with all we have offended while operating, living, and preaching according to God's will. <clears throat> Excuse me. Should we not also mourn before God for all these serial monogamous marriages bordering on polygamy in the houses of God, all of which are contrary to Christ's own clear and consistent teaching against adultery in the sight of God? Should we not respond like Ezra and those faithful to God with him when they sat down astonished at the news of the remarriages to heathen women in their day, having put away the wives of their youth. Ezra was so grieved that he literally pulled his hair out. He feared God concerning the transgressions of the men. He clearly was surprised that the men had done this. Ezra was almost in spiritual shock about these choices and could not move or speak for hours. After all, God had just allowed them to return back to their nation coming back from the very captivity in which God himself had brought them because of these very sins and other iniquities. It took Ezra and some faithful elders months to straighten out these situations for all those who came and confessed their sins. Seeking to be clear with God, some of the men even had children by their non-covenant wives, but nevertheless, they went and humbled themselves before God. Those who would not get right with God in this transgression were no longer counted in the genealogical records. Even if one is not able to reconcile with one's true spouse in this brief lifetime, prayer and fasting should be offered to God for the salvation of the wayward one. When people are living in obedience to Jesus' command, they can stand on God's word with authority and confidence when they pray. They can ask God with blessed assurance to help the wayward ones to remember their vows and to be convicted, convinced of their sin and their need for Jesus' atonement. Fornication, which Paul discussed 
in the previous chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, is a horrible sin against one's own body, one from which all should flee. But is that what is being taught and even modeled to the youth of our day? I have known of Christian and secular parents alike. They have allowed boyfriends or girlfriends to cohabitate under the parents' own roof with the reason that it is safer, sort of like a practice marriage. This is more like a prescription for disrespect and disaster and a future lack of trust that often leads to divorce. We have lost our collective mind. Other Christians allow drinking parties in their homes because, after all, since the young people are probably going to drink alcohol anyway, they might as well as do it in a safe environment. Does anyone else see the spiritual absurdity in all this? Does anyone else see the logical extension of this line of thinking? Why limit the practice of safe sinning to merely these two activities? Are not our homes to be little sanctuaries while we sojourn here on earth? Places of wholesome and refreshing fellowship and activity? Places of refuge for others escaping from the insanity? Places to model Christ's wisdom to the community? Sound Covenant Marriage Advice from Paul Those who have, been, who have made the choice to abstain from sexual impurity prior to marriage contribute greatly to the blessing of their covenant marriage. To learn self-control, which ought to be taught to every young man and woman, is also healthy for the marriage relationship. Paul, when writing to the Thessalonians, put it this way, that we are to learn to keep our vessels, mind, body, and spirit, unto sanctification and honor. Practically speaking, as we read, as we shall read next, both husband and wife should know how to be separate physically from one another for seasons of fasting and prayer and even for seasons of sickness. In these situations, it is imperative that the husband and wife truly love one another as Christ loves them. Notice that Paul said, learn. This means that though we may stumble and fall at times, we can and must learn to come to that beautiful place of temperance and self-control, seasoned with love and joyfulness. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incon inconsistency. Uh, is that, how's that word? Uncontens incontensency. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment, for I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man has his proper gift of God. In parentheses he put, and being remarried outside of God's established marriage covenant is not the proper gift to which Paul is referring. Best scripture. One after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and the widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 3-9 when Paul is referring to the unmarried in verse 7, he is referring to women who have never married. Widows would be free to marry someone in the Lord, but only in the Lord, if their first husband had died. This is a perfect agreement with Paul's teaching on the marriage covenant in Romans chapter 7, 1 through 3, which was discussed earlier. We should expect there to be agreement between Jesus and Paul and Paul's instructions to the Romans and the Corinthians. The advice he gives to married couples is healthy and sound, further emphasizing the one flesh nature of the marriage covenant designed and instituted by God. In saying that the husband and wife had power over each other's body, Paul was not implying any domination or abuse, but rather a true hearing and sensitivity, a loving, willing subordination to each other born out of natural affection. 
By following Paul's instruction, the wife and the husband and the wife would show an understanding of each other's needs and desires <clears throat> as a married couple in order that self in order that the self selfishness, I'm sorry, would not be permitted to reign in either heart against the other. Paul tells the husband in Ephesians 5 that he indeed is to be the head of the home, but that he is to both lead and serve in the spirit of Christ's love, wisdom, protection, and sacrifice. And I'm going to end that there for now. Hold on one minute. <coughs> I'm sorry, guys. All right, brothers and sisters, take this to the Lord in prayer. Seek seek his face for answers. Search the word. Study, rightly dividing the word of truth. And always keep your eyes on Jesus. Your nose in the book, which is the word of God. And embed the word of God upon the tablets of your heart. So you will not sin against God or be deceived. Till next time, I love you all. Bye-bye.